Listen up or run for cover. Bradley Bums. is dropping. Bums. So where did you learn all of this? It started out earlier in my career. I was San Francisco's number one hair, San Francisco's number one men's hairstylist. Now I don't know if you've seen the movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I walked out on it, but yeah. You walked. You didn't wait. To, you didn't see the last scene then. No. The last act. Well, the characters. My boss that I worked for was one of the characters. He was a friend of Sharon Tate's. His name was Jay Sebring. He was the Hollywood hairstylist. Now, in real life, one Friday night, we were standing at the end of our booze and we shook hands and for the first time he kissed me on the cheek and said, you're doing terrific haircuts. That night, he flew to Los Angeles. He was with Sharon Tate and the Manson family murdered them. He was there that night? He was murdered with Sharon Tate, Abigail Folger, and her boyfriend, and Stephen Tennant, who was the really like the groundsman. Who, wow. yeah. So in the film, the film was a story. It wasn't true because in the film they go to the wrong house where Leonardo, Leonardo, Leonardo's character lives, and Brad Pitt was was there. So in real life, my boss was murdered with Sharon Tate, but he was Hollywood's number one hairstylist. So I would pick up the phone, it'd be Steve McQueen saying, hey, can Jay go racing tomorrow? So I'd have to call all his clients and say, I'm sorry, Mr. Sebring's been called out of town on business. Can I reschedule your appointment? He was racing with Steve McQueen. Anyway, when, when Jay died... I didn't realize it would happen, but I became really the, ha- the the media personality for the salon. It was new industry. Anyway, I digress. If you think of this, Brad, when I was a men's hairstylist in this very posh salon and then my own business in the financial district, I had 16 executives, up and coming salespeople sitting in my chair. As I often ask my audience, if you had a multimillionaire all to yourself for 45 minutes, what would you ask? Or a salesperson who made $200,000 a year in commissions in 1972. Or a trial lawyer who would explain his strategies for winning unprecedented awards. That was an average day for me before 10 o'clock in the morning when I was a men's hairstylist. So, of course, I learned so much from my clients and then... You know, I started speaking. In the early days, I was speaking about how to get, keep, and deserve customers because that's what I did superbly well in my own business. And then over the years, you know, taking screenwriting classes and working with great speech coaches and and some of my best friends are brilliant copywriters. And so it's really, when I help clients, it's 40 years of studying communication all inside me. The, and applied uh, hmm? and applied which and applied, means you've tried yeah. it all you yeah. saw what works oh, yeah. what doesn't work and i've i've you know every time you work with a new company or a new client you're smarter and more valuable to the next ones mm. so that's anyway i bet you've never been this quiet in the interview ever so i'm now going to shut up and let you say something no it's good that means yeah. that means you're dropping bombs and, yeah. and not only that i already know that you know what you're talking about yeah. uh You know, if I ever, like, wanted to be a speaker, a professional speaker, I would have to listen to you. I don't really think I'm a speaker, as you can definitely attest. I think I just talk. And I think part of the the reason people hire me and Mm -hmm. want me to talk is because of how I talk and how I kind of keep it simple. Like they're not, there's not a lot of corporations calling me. Matter of fact, someone called and, and, and said, Hey, this company would like for you to call them about speaking. And this was mm. like a real speaking gig. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I call them and I felt almost like I was being auditioned. 
And they were like, well, how would you answer this question? And what would you well, talk welcome about? Welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like that world. Yeah. I got to tell you. It's like mm. I want to talk to people if they know who I am mm. and they want to hear something I talk about, mm. I, I'll go talk. Mm. But I'm not a speaker, obviously. And well, if I were going to be yeah. one, I would definitely uh, study everything that you have more in depth and actually apply it. Because I have... I have uh, used some things but when i when you get up there it's like if you're not rehearsed mm. and and practiced and drilled like would you say scott mccain is a good speaker oh scott mccain is incredible okay now every time i watch yeah. him he pauses at the exact same moment he literally will do the same yes. speech every time now for a professional speaker that gets paid to do that, it makes perfect sense. Why? Because if I saw you on stage and I want you to come do it at my event, I don't want to hear some variation. I want to hear exactly what you just said to that audience. I'd like, man, you got to talk to my audience. I want to hear that. But when you're that rehearsed, that means it's a, it's a craft, or as you would say, a craft. Yeah, and really, that was what surprised me early when I just went to see speakers and I was taught, well, when people hire you, they want to hear what they, they come up and they say, we want our people to hear that. But what I would say, cause now, you know, I, there was a time, Brad, that I was one of the hot young speakers. I deliver 120 keynotes a year, but it's very unrealistic to think that you're going to be flavor of the month for, for 20 years with speakers bureaus and I milked it to death. But the secret for me was I listen to my clients and this is true for anybody in business. You listen to your customers and clients and they would tell you what they want to pay for. See folks, I've been saying that for years when it comes to sales. Like too many salesmen just start talking about a product. They didn't ask any questions. And I say, the customer will tell you what they yes. value. The way I say it, the key to connection is conversation. The secret of conversation is to ask questions. But the quality of the information you receive depends on the quality of your questions. So it's very important. You're absolutely right. You have to listen to your clients. But I had a couple of turning points that, really changed my career. One, I was speaking at a national sales meeting and the national sales manager came up and said, I liked your speech, but I loved how you delivered it. Can you teach our salespeople to speak that way? Because it takes us a year to get in a position to deliver a one hour presentation to a hospital board. It's worth $9 million a year if we get the business. And we are losing sales. It has nothing to do with our offering or price. It has to do with our competitors deliver better sales presentations than we do. And little did I know that she had just given me the secret of always being in demand, even when I don't look quite as good on iMag. The second one, because I'd always work with speech coaches and I love talking about speaking to other speakers. And one day I was speaking for a personnel company close to home, 35 miles from my house. And I gave a speech. The president gave a speech, the president of the company, and then we had lunch. And she said to me, Patricia, do you do any speech coaching? I said, a little for some of my friends. And she said, I wish I was one of your friends. I drove home and on my answering service, I heard this dynamic frip kind of woman say, I don't know if you do this, but if you do, I want to hire you for my husband to give him for his birthday. And I think, well, I have jumped out of cakes before I could do it again. And then she said, seven of my salespeople came to your speaking school. My husband is, a, they raved, and my husband is a good speaker, but he has a really important presentation. If you do an executive coaching, I want to hire you. And I thought, God, twice in an hour, I got the message. And that was the day I officially 
put my shingle up. Yes, I'm an executive speech coach. And he was my first official client. Mm. But what is so good, Brad, is that my speech coaching clients, my executives and sales teams and working with engineers, once you have the client, it's ongoing. It's the same events every year. Most people, even if they love you, and I've had clients you know, that, that hire me multiple times for keynotes, but they're not going to have the same keynote speaker every year. They do with a sales trainer, a speech coach. Sure they do. Yeah. That's why every single sales team should be hiring you. And if they can't afford the real you. They can have the virtual me. They get the they get yeah. the virtual version, which, by the way, folks, it's fully interactive. It's almost yeah. like she's sitting there coaching you. She asks questions, tests you, all that. But if you guys are listening, you have a small team, few people, large people, you probably can't afford her her in person. Well, let's not say if, that. If it, Well, but, if they're small. Yes. But all I'm saying is you're not cheap to hire in person. Well, I let me put it this way, and I'm sure Brad Lee would say this. If your sales, uh, one sale of more than 10,000, you can get a package of free. So for example, any company, even if it's only a team of five or six, we always do an hour Zoom kickoff to help them with their presentations, show them around the system, so they can afford some version of FRIP. Oh.